Cindy asked me to say a few words of explanation about the charity. Uh, it's probably a safe assumption that a lot of you won't know about the charity, but can I just look for evidence of that? How many of you have heard anything about Action Against Medical Excellence, ATMA, as we call ourselves? A small, small smattering, and I guess most of those will be as a result of Mid Staffordshire and the publicity and everything around that. Um, so a few words of explanation before I get into the, the real meat of the discussion. Um, what are we? Well, we're an independent charity. We've actually been going for 30 years, believe it or not. So when we started, people didn't even talk about patient safety. Uh, even we, you know, we'd use the term medical accidents, things going wrong. Uh, people were telling us to go away, that you know, this doesn't happen in our NHS. Um, and people uh, as eminent as Sir Ian Donaldson and Sir Ian Kennedy have said that our charity uh, played a bigger role than most in actually bringing about the whole patient safety awareness and movement uh, in the UK. So we see our role as promoting patient safety, um, but also in promoting justice in the wider sense, fairness uh, for people who've been affected by medical accidents. And this is the point where you can boo and hiss if you like, uh, but one of the key roles of the charity, the outward facing part of the charity, is that we provide independent advice and support to people, patients, and families where things have gone wrong. Uh, we explain to them what their rights are, uh, we explain to them what their different options are, we explain some of the medicine, uh, we ex explain some of the medico-legal uh, terminology and processes that they need to know about to make a decision about what to do next. Um, I'm actually in a very privileged position, I'm chief executive of the charity, uh, but I'm not a lawyer, so that gives me some brownie points. Um, I'm not a clinician. Uh, I'm the patient champion in the middle of this, but I have the privilege of working with some of the best clinicians and uh, lawyers also uh, in the country. And uh, in some cases, we actually refer on to those lawyers if a legal remedy is required. Uh, it's only a very small minority of the cases we deal with. The important thing is that prevention is better than any remedy or cure. We're absolutely passionate about working in partnership with the professions, with individual professionals, uh, with bodies representing professionals, but with the NHS, the Department of Health, to make sure that lessons are learned uh, and that all of our best interests are served by putting the learning from those lessons into practice. I can always summed up by our strapline, really. We fight for patient safety and justice. So, the Francis Report on Mid Staffordshire. Um, uh, actually, two years on the actual public inquiry itself, but before that, there was the first inquiry that Peter uh, referred to. Over £13 million pounds have been spent on the public inquiry itself, um, and it's come up with 290 recommendations. Now, I'm not going to go over the detail of what happened at Mid Staffordshire. You will have heard a lot of it. Peter's referred to some of it, but it was truly shocking. Um, but we see as a national charity, we deal with 3,000 inquiries a year through a, a helpline uh, and a casework service we provide to people throughout the country. And we see pockets of what happened in East Staffordshire, not on the same scale, but pockets of truly shocking levels of care in hospitals up and down the country. So it's not just about that trust, it's about the whole NHS and the whole system. And we believe that if the recommendations were implemented, it would make a hugely dramatic positive difference to the standard of care uh, provided in this country, and also, and, and one really comes before the other, fundamentally this word culture, uh, it would help change the culture to make it much less likely that something like that could happen again. I've summarized some of Francis's key themes as the following, caring, compassion, and professionalism including, crucially, leadership and the role that hopefully all of you are going to be playing within our health service. Um, regulation, the external stuff. I mean, everyone appreciates that really the most important thing is what uh, people do at the coalface and at the board level within organisations. But you do need that safety net. Uh, and he's got some important things to say about getting a more simple and proactive system of regulation to spot problems before they become too endemic and systemic in organisations uh, and step in and do something about it, which didn't happen in mid-staffs. It 
wasn't just what happened and went wrong in the hospital, every other organization that had responsibility for monitoring that hospital failed abysmally to do anything about it, uh, despite all of the warning signs that were there, and patients weren't listened to. Uh, openness, transparency, and candor, as Peter said, is a theme I'm gonna talk in more detail about, and listening and hearing patients and relatives. Um, if only their voices had been heard, uh, things would not have been allowed to get anywhere near as bad as they got. And the same story happened up and down the country. <laughs> um, my take on the government response, I've obviously there isn't time to go through the 290 recommendations, uh, but they do actually fit into those few themes in actual fact, and many are consequential on the others. Um, even put little smiley or sad faces next to these in case you needed any clues as to what we actually think about and whether they're good or not. We campaigned for uh, years, over, over a decade, for what we call a statutory duty of candor, uh, which Francis recommended wholesale, unequivocally, came out in support of. And perhaps the most, dr most important thing, most shocking thing um, about this is that for over 60 years, the NHS has done no more and pay lip service to this fundamental principle. Uh, patients, members of the public uh, on the street, your friends, relatives, you know, uh, if they're the same as mine, um, when you say to them, actually, there is no statutory rule that says that an NHS organization has to tell the patient or their families, even in the most serious cases of severe harm or death, exactly what happened. I could totally gobsmacked. How could we allow that situation, that culture, which effectively tolerated cover-ups in our system to go on for so long without taking serious action? And there was fierce resistance to this. We complained long and hard. Uh, and even when we got Francis to recommend it, um, there was still staunch resistance to this basic fundamental principle that we should always be open and honest if things go wrong. Um, Hopefully, this statutory duty of candor, if designed properly, um, will make the dramatic change in culture uh, that we're hoping for. Uh, we would say that if implemented properly, this is probably the biggest advance in patients' rights and probably patient safety uh, in the history of the NHS. Put simply, an organization that is prepared to cover up is going to be an unsafe organization. A professional who's prepared to cover up is going to be unsafe. Um, we would also build in the duty of candor support and protection for patients, uh, for professionals, sorry, in doing the right thing. A small step was made in that direction with the announcement that gagging clauses for whistleblowers uh, would uh, be banned, um, not before time. But much more needs to be done uh, to prevent the situation arising where people have to become a whistleblower where people working in NHS organizations or private healthcare organizations for that matter uh, are able to raise concerns and be heard uh, and uh, action to result before they actually become a whistleblower. Um, sadly, um, we've talked about already the importance of leadership that Peter has, uh, which I fully endorse. Uh, so does Francis, so does Don Berwick. Um, Francis recommended a regulatory system for managers, um, similar uh, to those applying to your good selves um, in the medical profession and other health professions. That's not been taken on board. Uh, neither has a recommendation of healthcare assistance coming under a regulatory regime being accepted, uh, which seems extraordinary given after all this deliberation, Francis, having heard from everybody and explored the evidence, um, uh, coming out so unequivocally that there should be for these people who in our hospitals spend more time with our patients and vulnerable patients than anybody else uh, possibly should be under some form of regulatory uh, regime <coughs> standards. He recognized that actually resources, staffing levels, uh, do have an impact. Some people would like us to believe that resources don't have anything to do with this, but certainly not the whole answer, um, but boards that are understaffed, clinics that are understaffed, theatres that are understaffed, um, again, 
those reasons are likely to be an element shirts are more dangerous places. He recommended national guidelines uh, on minimum staffing levels. The government don't want it. Um, so not everything from Francis is being followed through, including some of these really quite fundamental things. In the system of regulation, um, we haven't got time to go through the complicated matrix of different organisations who are involved in performance management and regulation, but you'll have heard of the main regulator, the Care Quality Commission. Um, there's also Monitor, who deal with foundation trusts. There was, until recently, <coughs> strategic health authorities, primary care trusts, etc., as we've been rejigged. Um, he recommended, in a nutshell, a much simpler system. Too many people involved in this. In mid-Staffordshire, everybody said it was someone else's responsibility. No one actually took responsibility for dealing with the problems. Um, the government, however, have recommended uh, 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 something rather different from what Francis was recommending, which is actually separating out the recognition of the problem, identifying the problem, which would sit with the CQC, and once they've recognised the problem, they would ask another organisation, the NHS Trust Development Authority, or Monitor, to do the intervening. That seems to me to be a bit of a recipe for disaster. It's going back to that same problem we saw in Staffordshire, too many people involved. Action actually relying on one organisation accepting and acting upon recommendations from another organisation. And from the patient's point of view, I don't know if you've heard of the new patient's body called Health Watch. Um, there's going to be local Health Watch and Health Watch England. They're the patient's watchdog in health and social care. Um, he recognised that the patient's voice is vitally important, that you can't rely on there being a Julie Bailey in every town in our country to raise the alarm. Um, there should be systems, and she should have, and her colleagues should have been listened to. Um, through a system that represented patients. In fact, everyone should have listened to that, but if you have gone to a robust organisation, we used to have things called community health councils, which he recognised were much more fit for purpose and would have raised the alarm earlier and would have helped Julie and her colleagues. He made two recommendations about health watch. Um, one, their funding should be ring-fenced. At the moment, it's just given away to local authorities. They can decide to spend it on health watch or they can use it for any of the other local authority responsibilities, such as filling potholes or other council services. Um, one local authority has already announced that it's taking 80% of the money that was meant to be for Health Watch to subsidise its own budget. He also recommended there should be a consistent model, and if you, you have that problem with funding, you are going to have a totally inconsistent model. The government are not heeding at the moment that recommendation. So, uh, a lot of good will come from Francis, mostly the duty of candour and changes in culture that we hope will result from that. Um, but uh, a lot of work still needs to be done to get his recommendations uh, and action taken by the powers that be. I want to move on, as per my brief, to give my ideas of tips for good leadership in health. And I really want to concentrate on just these three things. Uh, first of all, to uh, for, for every leader in health to have it as second nature that patient safety comes first. That people have an understanding of um, uh, the, the, the theory and the evidence around patient safety uh, are able to recognise risk um, and take action to improve safety and have a patient safety culture at the foremost of their thinking uh, that they spread uh, to, to others uh, working in the health service. Secondly, that patients are, are first, that you, through the lifetime of your career, remember the passion and motivation that brought you into this profession in the first place, and don't allow it to get beaten out of you, don't get worn down, don't let the bastards get you down, I think is the, uh, uh, the phrase. Um, there are people there who will try and wear you down. Uh, they'll try and prevent you doing what you know to be the ethical right thing to do. And I want to talk in more detail about this whole concept of duty of candor, being open, the openness and honesty, being the only sensible option, as well as being the right thing to do ethically 
it being the right thing to do practically for a whole range of reasons. Okay, um, I'm going to skip through these slides because we're limited time, but um, uh, you'll be aware of Hippocrates <coughs> and what he said uh, about um, first do no harm. Um, but I, I, I think this is a very apt quote from Sir Cyril Chandler when he says medicine used to be simple, ineffective, and relatively safe is now complex, effective, and potentially dangerous. Um, you will be involved in some point in your career in something going wrong. You might be a part of a team, part of a system, you may not be directly, personally responsible, um, but you will come across it. And here are some facts and figures about the scale of the problem that I'm sure you've come across so far. Uh, but tens of thousands of avoidable deaths potentially, and at least 250,000 medical accidents causing harm. Compare that with other disasters that hit headlines. Uh, road traffic accidents, 1,800 deaths in 2010. The Airbus A380, up to 850 passengers, and that goes down. The Marchioness, 51 deaths. Clapham Rail Star, up to 35 deaths. Um, the NHS is huge in terms of the avoidable harm that actually results. Financial costs, of course, um, at least one billion extra treatment costs, two billion if you include uh, health acquired infections, and almost 900, in fact, it's gone over 900 million pounds on clinical negligence claims. Just a quick uh, reminder, though, that don't be under the illusion that there really is a litigation culture when it comes to, um, to medical mishaps. Um, look at these figures 1.2 million reported incidents of things going wrong. 85,000 moderate to severe harm or death, and yet <coughs> only approximately 8,500 claims. In our experience, people are very reluctant to take legal action. When they do, it's usually for one or two reasons. One, at the moment, there's no other scheme in place to get practical financial help with the ongoing health problems, loss of income, etc., that uh, can devastate people's lives. <coughs> The other, and this is very, very commonly given to us as a reason for turning to the law, is simply to get the truth and to get some sense of accountability uh, for what's happened. So, just a reminder, this is about real people and real lives. The real cost is in human lives. Uh, the shock, bewilderment, anger, loss, fear for the future, loss of trust in the NHS, the patients and families suffer. But let's not forget there are other human costs. The second victim is those of you who at some point in your career are going to be involved in a medical accident. The loss of confidence, the feeling of shame, <coughs> unnecessarily, I believe, in many, many instances. Some people leaving medicine or practicing so-called defensive medicine um, because of the fear um, or the experience they've had. Um, more on being open due to cancer. So Liam Donaldson, probably you know, one of the, the absolute champions of patient safety that there has been sums it up this way, to err is human, but to cover up is unforgivable. And it's hard to summarize it better than that, really, that we all have to appreciate, and certainly patients, and patients' organizations like mine, appreciate that mistakes will happen. I make mistakes in my job. Um, my organization makes mistakes. Um, you will make mistakes. Um, that is only human, but it really is totally unforgivable uh, to cover up. However, it does happen, you know. Uh, this is an interesting statistic from a, an audit uh, commission uh, survey of NHS trusts who voluntarily provided this information. Only 24% routinely informed patients when they're involved in a patient safety incident. 6% did not inform patients at all. For years, we've had this paying lip service. Everyone, everyone would say it's mother and apple pie. People should be open and honest. Of course, you won't get someone on this um, stage, I suspect, saying otherwise. Uh, but people haven't been prepared to put their money where their mouth is. Until now, the government have actually accepted the France's recommendation for a statutory GP Canada. It all started from this young lad, uh, over 20 years ago, uh, died um, as a result of negligence. Um, but what then ensued was um, what appears to be uh, doctoring, forgive the pun, of his medical records uh, in an attempt to prevent uh, the family knowing exactly what happened. Um, so we lent our campaign the name Robbie's Law. 
John Moore Robinson's case was absolutely pivotal, I believe, in getting Francis to recommend a statutory duty of candor. Uh, this was a young man who went into Stafford a &E, and he had a bicycle accident. Um, he was discharged uh, after a short period of time with suspected bruised ribs. Uh, he died um, hours later from bleeding spleen. Um, an internal investigation by a doctor, a uh, senior doctor in A&E, concluded that the care had been unsatisfactory, normal protocols and procedures weren't followed, and had the normal standard of service in A&E that evening been followed, it would probably have saved his life. That report was not only suppressed from John's family, uh, but it was suppressed from the coroner who is conducting an inquest into John's death. And in an internal memo, the in-house solicitor justified the decision uh, on the basis that it would not, quote, be in the trust's best interests for this be to become public or to be revealed to the family. Um, she went on to say, nor probably would it be uh, in the family's best interest to have these concerns brought to their attention at a sensitive time. Um, when they gave evidence at the inquiry, it was the most chilling moment for me in the whole inquiry, uh, as chilling as some of the, the actual examples of horrendous plans of care. They had no sense of insight that that approach was wrong. They didn't apologize for it. They said their role as a lawyer was to act in their client's best interests, and if that meant suppressing this information in the interest of the trust, so be it. There are other cases as well. But I said, it's not just the ethical right thing to do. Um, it is in everyone's interests to do the right thing for practical reasons. People are, in our experience, and there is international evidence to support this also, are much less likely to sue or complain if they're dealt with honestly from the onset. Uh, one surgeon told me um, that um, in his experience, the people who stayed in touch are the ones uh, that he'd had the difficult discussions with, more so than the people he'd done the fantastic job for. The consequences of covering up are much, much worse than the consequences of being open. Um, there's no guarantee that someone won't make a complaint uh, or a referral to the GMC or seek compensation. I would argue that's only fair and reasonable in, in those cases that merit uh, that kind of action. Um, but seeking the cover-up can lead to your eraser from the register. Uh, it's in the code of the GMC that you must be open and honest. Moreover, now that we have a commitment to organisations having a statutory duty of candour, your employer will be taking this doubly seriously. Um, so we've moved from the situation where everyone knows it's the right thing to do to it being absolutely crystal clear that it's a no-brainer. You've got to do the right thing. Uh, of course, the other reason that no one would want to be in a situation of having covered something up uh, is imagine working for the rest of your career with that monkey on your back. It's not a good place to be. Um, and as I said earlier, um, for the good of all of us, for the organisations, um, patients as a whole uh, and the health service, that uh, those who are prepared to tolerate that kind of behaviour, that kind of lack of ethics, are going to be unsafe. Uh, and it is our experience that those organisations, those bodies where the culture is wrong, they're the ones that are also unsafe. Very similar to the point about leadership. Um, some practical uh, information. Do get your holds on, your, your hands on, uh, the NHS uh, being open guidance and they provide excellent training. It's all very easy to trot out these words about what should be done. Uh, actually fronting up to a patient or a family member when something's gone wrong that's caused harm must be the most difficult job that any health professional has to do in their career. It's not easy. Uh, there is guidance, there is training available on how to go about it. So do access it. And we can help. Uh, we can provide talks, training, and guidance from the patient's experience and real patient speakers to talk about their experience to try and open people's 
heart and mind about how important these issues are and how to, to deal with these very difficult issues. Um, I don't know if any of you have come across Daniel Sokol. Uh, he's a medical ethicist. Um, I think there's a very good article here uh, which is talking about this most difficult job that a health professional uh, ever has to do in their career, the hardest thing, admitting error. Um, do have a look at it, but if you look on, on the BMJ website, also look at the trail of comments that follow it. This was about 18 months ago, yeah, or a year ago, sorry. Um, and uh, what was interesting is that there are a lot of very defensive comments that came up. People basically saying it's the hardest thing, but it's the only way to go. Uh, and there was various people posting up there saying, oh yeah, but if you do that, they're going to sue you, they're going to complain. We've got the right to cover this up, you know. Um, it really is quite worrying. We have got a long way to go to change the culture, uh, but recent developments should help that. Um, in case anyone's in any way kind of um, dubious about the, where my organisation is coming from, um, uh, or anything I said in, in any way scary, have a look at this document on our website, which is on the last slide. Um, it proves that health professionals and patients want the same thing. We've got this charter which covers seven broad areas um, that I haven't met a doctor or a nurse yet who isn't happy to sign up to. And it goes to the very heart of what patients think is most important. It is about real people, real lives at the end of the day. Never lose that, that passion that you have that motivation that brought you into the profession, um, but it includes you. Um, we're all human, and there can be secondary victims. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, but here's some information, uh, if you want to access it, where a lot of the uh, stuff I've been referring to could be got hold of and how to contact me. And I'm looking forward, I hope, to a lively discussion, debate, lots of difficult questions for the two Peters. <laughs>